Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Rutgers Food Science IFT Virtual Student and Alumni Celebration. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Brian McGonigal. I am the Manager of Alumni Community Engagement for the School of Environmental and Biological Sciences and the New Jersey Agricultural Experiment Station. Um, we've got a great program for you. I just want to go over a few announcements before we get started. Um, we'd ask that everybody remain muted uh, through the program until we get to the breakout room sessions. Uh, we'll have several people speaking and presenting and it would be best if everybody's on mute so there are no interruptions. So if you could just mute yourselves. And for the members of the committee who will be speaking at certain times, you can unmute yourself when it's time for you to speak. Uh, the event is being recorded as it was stated in the registration uh, for uh, subsequent viewing. We will post it and uh, people who aren't able to attend will be able to uh, hear Lou's presentation. Uh, if you have questions uh, about anything, particularly about uh, Lou Cooper House's presentation, please enter those questions in the chat box and they will be answered uh, as best we can with the time allowable. We're, we're expecting about 10 minutes uh, for Q&A. So uh, if Lou's uh, planning to speak, I believe, from about 6.45 to 7.05 and then from 7.05 to 7.15, we'll do a Q&A. Um, please enter your questions there and we will answer them as best we can. Okay, I think with that, I am going to turn it over to uh, the Food Science Alumni Committee Chair, uh, Joe Panarisi. Uh, Joe, take it away. Thank you, Brian. Uh, welcome everyone, really uh, excited to uh, continue this uh, tradition of uh, having our annual meeting with the Alumni Committee and the students and the alumni with, uh, in addition to the uh, National IFT. Uh, we really have a, uh, a, a great presentation that's going to happen today. Um, I'd like to really, you know, really thank the committee and the department. Uh, really, they put a lot of uh, effort in Brian, uh, a lot of effort into uh, pulling this together. Uh, I look forward to uh, a lot of people uh, being uh, social and engaging in our breakout rooms and things like that. So I'm hoping that everyone will do that. But uh, we have a really exciting agenda. Uh, first, we're going to have uh, Dr. Matthews is going to give a department update. And then we're going to have uh, our keynote speaker, uh, Lou Cooperhouse, and uh, uh, he has an amazing uh, presentation for, for this uh, event. Then we're going to have uh, an update from the students. Uh, in addition to that, we're going to have an awards and recognition, uh, recognition uh, part. Uh, then we're going to do the breakout rooms uh, for networking. And then uh, finally, you know, we're going to pull back together and, uh, you know, talk about, uh, you know, uh, any questions that you might have, uh, as well as uh, thank, you know, thank yous. Uh, and um, really talk about, uh, you know, alumni engagement, as well as uh, the 75th anniversary that's going to come up. And I know Dr. Matthews is, gonna, is going to touch on that. That's at a very important event that's coming up for the food science department. And I'm hoping that all of the alumni uh, can reach out to, uh, you know, their colleagues and counterparts that, uh, you know, are graduates of the food science program and uh, engage in that uh, event in the fall. So without further ado, I'd like to hand it off to uh, Dr. Matthews. Okay, hopefully we're on here. So Evening, everybody. I guess maybe afternoon for some of the West Coast folks. And, um, you know, Mar Marissa's from Chile. I'm, I guess maybe that's Central or West Coast time. I'm not quite certain uh, what time zone those guys are in. But, I'm in DC. Oh, okay. Fantastic. Um, but, you know, I, I, as Joe was indicating, we've got a uh, really uh, nice program here for you guys tonight. I just wanted to go over a few things that have been going on in the department, uh, you know, these last 18 months or so, as everybody knows, has been somewhat of a challenge. Um, I think, you know, if you look at some of our faculty now, we're really uh, adept at Zoom and these other types of virtual platforms. But um, the ones that I really want to, you know, send a special thank you to are the students um, that have really hung there with us and allowed us to um, go through and try to reach them as, as best we can 
even though it's in a virtual format. Uh, the other thing with that is just trying to do our laboratories. And I, I really thank our graduate students and our faculty that have gone through and you know, they, they've re done the labs, they've recorded those labs, and in some cases they're doing them in real time. Uh, other faculty have been even more so inventive where they've had the students do the experiments utilizing their home kitchens and what's in those kitchens. Um, so I'm sure the parents love that if the students are living at home where they've taken over their kitchen to do food science experiments, but you know, that's what it's all about. Um, so anyhow, I think it's been a great learning experience, I, I believe, for all of us, and I, and I, I do believe that, you know, it's, it's the, this joint effort of both our faculty and students that have gotten us through this. The other thing, too, is, you know, you might be wondering what's going on from a research standpoint. Our labs have been operational during this time. Uh, we're trying to get the graduate students in so that they can finish their research and not be delayed in graduating and getting out into uh, pursue whatever their next adventure might be, whether that's on for another degree or it's going into um, a, some type of a job opportunity. Just reading off some other factors here, bullet points that I've, I wanted to mention is that, you know, we greatly appreciate all the donations um, from the alumni that have come into our program and that we're able to utilize those. Um, some of you may recall, I've mentioned it before, but uh, last year we received a very large donation. And so we're able to go ahead and pro um, purchase a high temperature short time uh, UHT um, process line for both juice and uh, milk products. And so that will be stationed in one of our pilot plants. And so we're trying to do some things where we bring in equipment that, you know, is going to uh, help out our students. As we know, it's a food science is a hands-on discipline and we need to have that type of equipment. We've also gone ahead and utilized some of those funds from donations for purchasing of uh, thermal cyclers. So we can do more molecular type activities in the laboratories uh, as well as experiments. Kind of getting back to this realm of teaching and, and some of the things that are going on, um, faculty awards, and I'll, I'll just mention a couple of these because there's numerous the faculty have received over the, this past year, but uh, our departmental Emdel Karmas Teaching Award uh, was given to George Carmen. So George, as many of you might well know, teaches food chemistry, and um, he's the the the, the person that went ahead and developed these laboratories where the students could do them in um, their home kitchen. So if somebody wants, to, <laughs> if they didn't like having their kitchens taken over, it's George. Um, the other side of this is that I just wanted to go ahead and, uh, and recognize uh, Don Schaffner. Uh, Don Schaffner received the 2021 Macy's Food Science and Technology Award from the Minnesota section of IFT. And you know, Don's done a tremendous job in educating the public on COVID and food and dispelling many of the myths surrounding that. Uh, finally, people might be wondering what's going on with respect to uh, return of students. So they will be returning to campus, um, both in resident as well as in classroom. Uh, so we're going to in-person in the fall semester. So I think that's exciting. Uh, not only for the faculty, but also for the students, maybe they can get out of their bedrooms and uh, into the classrooms. Uh, and the only reason I say that, as many of you know, uh, teaching classes, sometimes I would see the students that are in their rooms and just busy away trying to do their schoolwork. Um, the, the other thing that Joe had brought up was our 75th uh, anniversary celebration for our department. And we're planning that and what we'd like to have is an event where we have an in-person event. And that's why we're kind of wondering where things might be going, uh, not only in the state of New Jersey, but also for Rutgers, uh, so that we could have an in-person event, hopefully uh, this fall, perhaps sometime uh, in the month of November. So we'll keep you posted on that and be sending out more information. And then finally, what I do, I wanna do is just kind of end with, um, really thanking the Food Science Alumni Committee for their enthusiasm <clears throat> during this time in particular where 
having to go through and put together these programs, uh, organizing it, and uh, that's no small feat. And I really just want to recognize um, Joe Panarisi, Laura Rocco's, Mark Myers, Chris Endress, um, Rebecca Dengrove, Christine Lukasik, and uh, Rangoa. Uh, all of these folks have done an excellent job in really um, bringing all of this together for us. And then also Brian, as you know, he's, he's really facilitated these events for us and he continues to do a, a fantastic um, job uh, with bringing all of this to us. So that's really my, my mini update on uh, the food science program. Uh, you know, we're still going strong. There's a lot happening here. And, and I just think it's fantastic what the students are able to do, continuing to um, participate in scientific uh, uh, endeavors, uh, whether it's in the laboratory or at professional meetings like IFT and presentations there and also at New York IFT. So just a lot going on there. I think we're just about on time here. So actually this might even give uh, our speaker, Lou, a little bit extra time, maybe a minute or two more, because I, he's just got an exciting story to tell. So for some of you that didn't have the opportunity to, um, to, to read the bulletin that went out, our speaker tonight is uh, Lou Cooperhouse, and he's the co-founder and president and CEO of Blue Nalu. Uh, so that they have a company mission is to become a global leader in providing great tasting cell cultured seafood products. Um, so as it's been indicated before, and I, I know because I've seen his presentation, he's really prepared an outstanding talk for tonight that's going to inform all of us about this particular space that they're operating in. The other thing that I want to do is just to go ahead and recognize um, Blue Nalu and, and all the folks there they're finalists in the X Prize uh, Feed the Next Billion competition. Uh, so this competition looks at reinventing how humanity will feed the next generation by incentivizing the production of structured fish fillet alternatives that replicate or outperform conventional fish and access, environmental sustainability, animal welfare, nutrition, health, as well as taste and texture. It's a, a, a big, uh, you know, bite to swallow there, but uh, obviously I think these folks have it. So let me just give you a little bit more background about Lou. He's a recognized uh, leading global authority in food business innovation and technology commercialization. He has extensive leadership experience through his 35 plus years in the food industry. Uh, as many as you, uh, you might well know, uh, Lou served as executive director of Rutgers University Food Innovation Center, which is, in fact, a globally recognized center for economic development, provides a broad array of services to the food industry uh, and the entrepreneurs within that industry. The other connection that Lou has to Rutgers University is that he received his master's in food science and his um, bachelor's in microbiology, both from Rutgers, and he's also served as an adjunct professor uh, at the Rutgers uh, Business School. So he's really, uh, you know, been a, an integral part of the family at Rutgers University. And uh, I think he's going to share with us tonight uh, just an exciting new uh, uh, area that we're seeing within the food industry. So, um, Lou, it's all yours. Oh, thanks, Carl, and, and thanks uh, all of you. It's just great to get reconnected with Rutgers, and I thought I'd start off with my uh, loyal Rutgers hat for everybody. Um, I feel like I've never left, so we're, I'm really excited to, to create a, a new uh, campus uh, in San Diego, so anytime you guys want to set up a food science department, uh, let me help. Um, and uh, let me maybe um, I thought I'd share my screen here, and uh, let's see if this is working okay. Um, again, just really excited to talk today. Uh, I think that the idea of this uh, presentation is to really talk about this whole category, what's really going on in the food industry, kind of my own personal journey to get here, uh, and kind of uh, talk a little bit about Blue Nalu as a bit of a case study here. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think what, what uh, the team uh, that organized this uh, program wanted me to talk about is kind of my own personal journey. 
So one thing that was consistent about it was uh, I really do enjoy food innovation, food technology, uh, really from a management perspective and really a cross-functional interdisciplinary uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, objective as well. So after, uh, you know, actually my, my master's degree um, uh, names that many of you uh, will fondly remember, you know, Myron Solberg was my advisor and Elizabeth Steer um, uh, was on my committee. Uh, as was um, Tom Montville. So just really, um, as I really looked about, I really was working on, uh, uh, again, initially microbiology, and then I took a job at Campbell's Soup, working third shift at Campbell's, <clears throat> and then actually was getting my uh, master's uh, part-time and uh, found a really in great intersection between microbiology and food science, looking at perishability of prepared foods. Uh, kind of the front end, I just happened upon, and for those students that are on the, on the call today, um, you know, the left-hand side of the screen is kind of where I got started here. Initially at Campbell's, uh, init you know, first working into in a lab facility, third shift, as I mentioned. I then really had the opportunity to join a brand new business unit focusing on perishable foods, which is a brand new category for Campbell's. And that intersection of microbiology and food science really gave me a keen understanding of what it is that really causes foods to degrade. And I really put that into the perspective of really leading teams uh, and I really was the, the person assigned to develop the first prepared salad project at Campbell's at the young age of 23. Um, and then shortly thereafter, I was asked to lead a test market uh, on home meal replacement when that was a brand new term, working on prepared entrees, soups, salads, and desserts delivered by tuxedo drivers in a kiosk, end dial unit, uh, short order delivered. This was 1985, 1984. So I just happened to be on a number of entrepreneurial ventures from the very beginning. And it kind of fast forwarded into doing something similar to supermarket chain Grand Union, which many of you uh, who are my age would remember at the time had 400 stores, no longer exists. All the stores got sold off. Uh, and then subsequently at ConAgra, uh, where I was group leader uh, and then senior scientist there overseeing processed meats for this uh, uh, diversified uh, frozen food company and perishable food company. I then got involved in the mid 90s. So, you know, just in my early 30s and my first startup. So I co-founded a company in, uh, that was focused on medical nutrition. And frankly, it was an opportunity that uh, uh, led me to, uh, I'm sorry, I co-founded a company uh, that was uh, <laughs> pioneering sous vide technology uh, in, the, in the late 1980s, early 1990s that Nestle ultimately acquired. Uh, that was based out in Northern California. And after that, I actually got involved uh, in my uh, early mid thirties, uh, co-founding my first company, which was Menu Direct, which was kind of uh, a leader in really medical nutrition and also personalized uh, and also uh, kind of uh, products that were also associated with lifestyle conditions. So we worked on diabetes, celiac disease, low protein diets and dysphagia. Uh, and at that time it was my first reconnection actually with, with Rutgers. Uh, so I saw Brian Schilling on the call and he and uh, Soji Adelaja uh, or actually uh, uh, led a team of students in the uh, then Ag Economics Department to really look at the reimbursability of medical food. So uh, it was kind of my foray back into Rutgers, if you will. I subsequently was involved with some other businesses, did a lot of consulting in the 2000s and on. Uh, also uh, uh, was the president COO of a fresh cut produce company, FNS. And then from 2000 on, I uh, for roughly 15 of, of 20 years, I was the uh, director, then the executive director, as Carl mentioned, of the Rutgers Food Innovation Center, and really a chance for me to kind of give back and, uh, and really support other entrepreneurs. But during that time, I personally became fascinated with what was really happening in the food industry, uh, which really led to uh, a bit, quite a bit of introspection I did, uh, and then uh, ultimately uh, the birth of Blue Nalu. So for all the students on, on the call today too, I just really wanna encourage you, not just with IFT, but with other organizations to really get involved. You know, I just took it upon myself to get very involved in trade associations over the years uh, and all these uh, uh, organizations on this page here, I was uh, either on the board or chairman or president or executive committee or what have you, or on the editorial advisory board in one case, but you know, Refrigerated Foods, United Fresh, um, produce processing in my earlier part of my career. Then as I came back to Rutgers, got heavily involved uh, uh, and ultimately was the uh, president of the Food Processor Association, uh, the New Jersey Business Incubation Network. And then I got fascinated by the whole concept of incubation globally 
and was on the board of the International Business Innovation Association. So again, just really encourage everybody on the call, all the students in particular, to really see this as an opportunity to really exhibit leadership, but also, you know, the networking is, is extraordinary. And I can't tell you how frequently uh, people I met 30 years ago, I talked to, oh, I haven't talked to you in 20 years, 30 years, how's it going? You know, so the relationships you meet at these trade associations are really, um, you know, totally, totally amazing. So what I saw along that way, that journey was consumers were moving. So in the food industry, the first thing you look at is not what technology you can think about that may or may not have a market, but where's the market going? Um, so when you think about where the market is going, I really was personally, you know, really wowed by consumers where I was involved with perishable foods, convenient foods, healthy foods, high quality foods, using all sorts of technologies. I was on the front end of high pressure processing and sous vide and others, as I mentioned. But what I really saw a change here was consumers were looking for things not just healthy for themselves or their family, but for the planet. So they're looking at foods that really demonstrated trust, their purpose, their sustainability, uh, respect, transparency. Foods were telling a story and people wanted the foods to really resonate and communicate their own values. And those values include animal free products. So, and that's really kind of uh, what I found to be quite fascinating. So to me, 2012, just about 10 years ago, I saw the beginning of a change. So here I was uh, doing some consulting, uh, but also um, uh, at Rutgers and really uh, quite intrigued by something I saw getting started here that the, the whole conventional protein category was starting to be changed. It hasn't changed for thousands of years, you know, many ways, if you will, it's a bit biblical, particularly fishing. Hasn't really been, except for industrialization, which has its issues, uh, really hasn't evolved considerably since then. So what I saw really occurring, and I was doing a fair amount of public speaking on food trends and technologies, there are three new categories of food technology that were being, that were emerging. Plant-based, uh, known by many names, but you'll see it in a minute uh, referred to as vegan meat replacement. Uh, Plant-based began with the milk category, we'll talk about in a moment. Uh, fermentation technologies and also cell culturing technologies. Um, so plant-based, many of us are familiar with. We know about almond milk, oat milk, the many types of milk. Um, but uh, many of you might be familiar that Impossible Foods was our client at Rutgers. So I was managing that project for us and Impossible Foods was one of two, it's still one of two primary leaders here, Beyond Meat being the other. So Beyond Meat got quite a bit of recognition a few years ago as the, the most successful public offering since the year 2000. Um, an enormous success. The company is worth, uh, it varies on the day, but more or less $10 billion. You know, that's what has capitalized that. Uh, Oatly just had their IPO, also a $10 billion valuation. Um, and these companies are backed by some, you know, pretty high profile investors. Uh, and as you see on the bottom right, you know, Beyond Me Competitor and Apostle Foods is also, sources say, ready for their own IPO. So top right, just a lot of ESG fever. Uh, environmental, social governance type app, uh, uh, applications. So all areas of the investor community are all over this category of uh, really focusing on sustainable investing. So as I mentioned, plant-based milk has been around for some time um, and it's really evolved quite a bit in the last few years. You just heard about Oatly, but roughly 15% global market share of all milks are, is plant-based. And, and I know uh, Dr. Bill Holman's on the phone and there's quite a bit of uh, issues around nomenclature in the whole protein category. Um, and he did some great research in this space looking at the cell culture category, what would be the appropriate naming for that? But milk is kind of the precedent here where arguably it's not milk. It doesn't have the same calcium or other nutritional values as milk, but it has been called milk uh, by this industry nonetheless. So you're seeing other categories and this is kind of the year-over-year uh, -year growth, meat is growing very nicely at 19%, but still only represents uh, less of 1.5% of the global category. But you can see in all areas, the, the amount of uh, growth per year is quite significant uh, per GFI and spins. So this is plant-based dairy. Oh my God, you can see all the categories. You know, let's look at the subcategories, almond, algae, 
uh, banana, barley, uh, lotus flower, hemp, oat, uh, soy, rice, uh, quinoa, pecan. You get the idea. The same thing's happening in cheeses and yogurt and other dairy categories. This category will continue to be on fire. And here's little old Oatly over here in the oat category, as you saw, about to, you know, just had a 10 billion valuation. So you get the idea, the total capitalization on this page is enormous. Plant-based protein, also on fire, just a huge amount of growth. You know, companies doing jackfruit, here's impossible. You know, just many companies in this space, uh, including conventional companies like Nestle, like Tyson, have now entered this space. This is not a fad, this is a trend. This is a totally transformative uh, category that is coming to disrupt the pr traditional protein category. However, um, the cell cultured meat category is just beginning. There is essentially nothing on the market worldwide today, zero. But A.T. Kearney Company, the consulting accounting firm, projects that by the year 2040, the, comp the category that I'm in at Blue Nalu, cell culturing, will represent 35% global market share of all protein consumed, growing at a 41% annual growth rate for 2025 onward. Again, 2025 is about when you'll see the first small scale factories uh, being occurring uh, on this planet. We'll talk more about that in a minute. And here you see novel vegan meats, that's like impossible and beyond, showing a 9% annual growth rate representing 25% market share. What does this say differently? Conventional meat will become unconventional in two decades, going from near 100% in 2021 to 40% in 2040. So this prediction is that there is a total transformation. We are at the front end of something that is enormous as the computer sector was in the 1970s in Silicon Valley. Here we are 50 years later, we're still seeing huge advances in the computer sector. We can expect to see similar kind of uh, evolution and transformation in the food tech sector. There's no better time to be in the food science department or really be in this category, it's, cat it's really booming. So, the first proof of concept for cell culture beef only happened in 2013 uh, in London, uh, a company that became known as Mosa Meats, uh, began actually by a professor at Maastricht University, Mark Post, who did that first proof of concept with funding from Sergey Brin from Google, actually. Um, the first uh, cell culture chicken just happened a short time ago in Israel. So this category is again, brand new. But Blue Nalu, the company that I'm a co-founder of, began in late 2017. We were one of the first ones on the market, but you can see how this whole category has evolved considerably uh, since the first companies, Mosa Meat I mentioned, uh, Super Meat also in Israel, uh, Just out of San Francisco, Memphis out of San Francisco, Integra Culture out of Japan were the first five. Um, there's a fair amount of companies in Israel, a fair amount of San Francisco. Those are the two hotbeds for this activity but these companies are now around the world. Um, fermentation is the third category, as I mentioned. Even that has three subsets, traditional, biomass, and precision fermentation. Again, uh, replicating the same attributes as, uh, as protein products using mushrooms or all sorts of different uh, raw material substrates uh, using uh, potentially genetic engineering to actually accomplish these goals. So again, a fermentation, GFI, I, I, if you're not familiar with GFI, the Good Food Institute, gfi.org is our website. They have three reports on, on uh, plant-based fermentation and cell culturing that you can download for a deep dive. So I certainly recommend you go there for further information. But you can see the kind of growth here. Precision of biomass are the two categories with the greatest amount of companies. Does it necessarily represent the greatest opportunities? But again, uh, just a whole opportunity in this technology as well. So this is not just, uh, you, know, you know, in the food category, we are seeing non-food products and beverages. So Marks and Spencer in the UK pledges to make all wines 100% vegan by 2022. The Body Shop going vegan certified by 2023. Kylie, you know, not that I know anything about it, but Kylie Jenner's makeup brand going vegan. So Nike's sneakers are beginning with pineapple leather. Cars are looking at leather interiors going vegan. Neiman Marcus and several other uh, organizations have declared to go fur free. So you're seeing all sorts of activity at all players in the space really making moves here in this space. This one got a lot of press in the, in the New York, New Jersey area. 
uh, the, the three Michelin star restaurant, 11 Madison Park, you know, hard hit by COVID, decided to come back and be all vegan. Oh my God. And so they're claiming a 15,000 person wait list and a $335 uh, vegan menu. So uh, Mark Robson is on the call. He's willing to treat those. Sorry, Mark. And anyway, so you get the idea. There's just a lot of opportunity in this space. Uh, and you're seeing restaurants really being transformed as well. Um, the whole category, again, here you can see the amount of investments in different categories, plant-based, fermentation, and cultivated. Plant-based has really been the first, you know, category in the market, still growing nicely. Cell cultured is also doing well, and fermentation too. So all three categories are really seeing a lot of activity per pitch book. So in Blue Nautilus case, I got really excited by this category. And as Carl mentioned, our goal is to be the global leader in this space, um, you know, producing a wide array of products from fish shells. I realize I'm running short on time, so I'll speed up a little bit. We were founded in the state of Hawaii, so the word Nalo actually translates to a wave, wave of the ocean. And seafood got me excited because of the tremendous disruption potential for this space as demands are all time high, uh, but supply just cannot keep up. It's highly vulnerable, variable, has many issues associated with it, including mercury, toxins, poisons, pathogens, parasites, microplastics that can be incorporated into the seafood you consume, a fair amount of fraud, animal suffering, of course, ecosystem health, uh, and certainly illegal and overfishing as well. And advice to women that are pregnant or nursing to avoid or limit their intake of seafood. So Blunaldo, we're specifically targeting those species that are typically overfished or imported so we are not competing with aquaculture or wild caught fisheries, but working to supplement them instead. So that's the beauty of the seafood industry as well, as we're all about complementing our global supply chain and not competing with it. And we can do that very well with species like bluefin, uh, but also uh, mahi-mahi. And the way we do it is we're literally isolating those cells, satellite cells, uh, precursor muscle cells, or fibroblasts or preadipocytes from fish tissue, here you're seeing bluefin tuna, and we're isolating these cells and we're enabling them to grow and double and differentiate at the same time, uh, really creating uh, 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 essentially a starter culture, if you will. So having these cells double 50, 100, 200 times, uh, and then enabling them to freeze and thaw so that they can actually support large scale commercialization in a bioreactor facility. It looks a bit like a microbrewery. We've been able to accomplish this with a variety of species we are culinary centric and really able to accomplish the same nutritional and sensory characteristics as conventional seafood. Bluefin tuna is a very exciting opportunity because uh, if you will, like a cow, there's a very lean portion uh, towards the fin and a very fatty portion that commands a premium value uh, towards, the, uh, towards the body, towards the um, uh, uh, stomach, uh, where we can create various types of otoro or akami uh, cuts of sashimi grade tuna. So it really does create some really interesting opportunities where we literally sell 100% yield of product, just the product that we consume. We are no longer restricted by what we catch around the planet, but actually we can be, be demand driven instead. So our focus of Lunalo is to really have a commercialization process, a stage gate approach, very typical with any kind of R&D organization, focused on large scale profitability over time as you can see, escalating uh, from the bench to larger and larger bioreactors, uh, ultimately looking like that microbrewery. So this is back about 18 months ago. We were the first company in the world to demonstrate that we could do conventional cell cultured yellowtail amberjack uh, that looked the same, tasted the same, was really totally similar in all characteristics as conventional yellowtail. Uh, you can see this in a fish taco or a kimchi or ceviche or poke or butternut squat soup. Um, really an, out, an outstanding opportunity to demonstrate that our product really does, uh, whether it takes an acid in a, a ceviche type of form, it caramelizes, it really is fish in a new way. We're now building out a 40,000 square foot operation in San Diego. This will be a bit like the Food Innovation Center in concept, a place where we can launch new, new species and new forms, uh, one after the other, mahi-mahi, bluefin tuna, red snapper, et cetera. Uh, this is currently uh, under construction and we'll be ready early next year. So our strategy is to really uh, partner with companies uh, around the planet 
We've been able to do that very nicely. We've raised $85 million thus far. Um, as Carl mentioned, we're also proud to be a, uh, a semifinalist in this uh, XPRIZE global co competition to feed the next billion. We have partners that you know come from uh, Dutreco in the Netherlands, Griffith Foods, Rich Products, Pomoana, South Korea, Sumitomo, Japan, Taiyun in Thailand, and a Syngenta funded program uh, as well. So we're really uh, quite excited by our opportunity to work with supply chain partners and also distribution partners. We're very focused on Asia. We recently announced a, a, an MOU, Memory of Understanding, with uh, Thai Union and Mitsubishi to work uh, in Japan, but also Thailand and Singapore uh, to really understand the marketplace and really develop products unique for consumers in those regions. Again, very true to all the companies in the space. We are all aligned with the UN SDGs. Uh, number 14, Light Below Water is our core. Uh, but you can see that the benefit we're able to provide really supports uh, hunger, industry innovation, responsible consumption, climate action, higher paying jobs, decent work, good health, uh, and others as well. Uh, we were excited also by just a, a tremendous amount of global media coverage we've had. This category is really loved by the media, that's for sure. Um, and I'm happy to leave this up here for a moment. You know, my contact information, uh, go RU, uh, and our website is bluenalo.com. But feel free to reach out to me uh, if we don't answer uh, any of your, all of your questions uh, during this call today. I know Mark's going to moderate it for us, but feel free to reach out to me separately, and we'll happy to answer that later on. But uh, thank you all for your time. Great. Thank you very much, Lou. Um, Joe, I don't know if you have anything else you want to uh, mention before I uh, start doing the questions and answers, but I thought it was a great presentation. Uh, very, very well. I mean, I, I agree. I agree. Yeah. Uh, Lou, you did a Great job. You had a lot of uh, information, of course, in the end. <laughs> so uh, at least you kept it organized and, uh, you know, very uh, understandable. So don't worry about uh, whether or not you thought you were going too fast. Um, I just find it fascinating what you're doing and uh, opportunities moving forward uh, in the marketplace uh, globally. And I think uh, you're right. Uh, you know, the food scientists certainly are going to have a lot of opportunities uh, in this area. It's a good place. It's a good uh, place to be right now. So uh all right, Mark, I'll let you. Uh... Great. I, I see some new questions are coming in as we're talking. I'll try to keep up with them. I think we have about four to six questions so far. So anybody else, now's the time to start thinking if there's some, something you want to ask. But I'll start with uh, the questions in the chat box. We, got, we have uh, two other questions that somebody sent by email. So we'll get through those. Um, I even have a few questions, but we'll see how much time. And uh, Brian's going to be the timekeeper. Make sure we stay on time. So let me read the first one. Um, it's uh, from Thomas DeBrock. He's asking, how important do you think being non-GMO and or organic is to, uh, is to the success in this area? Yeah, I'll keep my answers as brief as I can, but uh, uh, there are companies that are using G GM technologies and those that are not. You know, we, we have committed to be a non-GM. Uh, we really design ourselves to be a global uh, company. And as you saw, we're really establishing a foothold in Asia and also ultimately in Europe. So we recognize that what we're doing is very different. Uh, and we want to minimize uh, any kind of, uh, we want to maximize adoption, uh, minimize regulatory hurdles. Uh, and both of those, I feel, can be accomplished by being, by being non-GM. And we've been able to enable that or determine that we can actually go that pathway. Uh, so that's a pathway of least resistance. It doesn't mean uh, being GM is not, will not be a successful approach, but for me, for a global global adoption, it's the appropriate uh, best best approach. Very good. The uh, next question is from uh, Rebecca Dengrove, and it's a two part question. The first one is, "What phase are you in right now?" And the second part is, "What's the biggest challenge in getting cell based protein to the market?" So the first one, a five phase strategy, where phase five is large scale commercialization and profitability. We're now in our new facility that's 40,000 square feet. We're entering phase two and three. We've been in phase zero and phase one. Phase zero is really all the fundamentals to get the cells to grow. And in our case, an animal-free media composition took a great amount of time. We've accomplished that uh, without genetic engineering with just about 200 stable cell lines of seafood uh, from eight different species we've done so far. So all the groundwork and the, those tools are in place. Phase one is like the three liter scale. So now we're entering between a 20 liter and 2000 liter scale, which are phase two and three, that'll be in our new facility. Uh, we'll have to graduate from that again uh, to a uh, first large scale facility, which will hopefully happen around 2025. 
The second question was, um, uh, let me pull it back. Biggest challenge? Uh, biggest challenge uh, in getting cell-based protein to the market. <laughs> Where do you start? I mean, another, another 40 minutes. Um, so the challenges are, are quite enormous. Nobody, it's, it's really about scale. Nobody has ever commercialized this technology before in scale. We're taking mammalian cell culture technology, which has been known for decades and applying this you know, for, for super high value, super low volume business to from farmer grade to food grade. So the supply chain is a challenge. The, uh, the commercial scale is a challenge. The CapEx is a challenge. The regulatory is, is a challenge today, but it's really will come down relatively quickly. Um, you know, no, you know, Singapore is the first country to approve of this technology uh, in a limited way so far. Uh, U.S. will probably have the first products in the market next year. I'm sorry, the first regulatory approval next year. So uh, we're seeing a lot of activity in Asia. The EU is also all over this category. Uh, nations see this as a food security solution in a big way. There's a lot of attention to the space, but uh, it, I, I would use I would, I would say a year ago regulatory, but I don't see that an issue any long, anymore. It's just about about scale and getting our costs down. Next question is from Laura Rakos, and she is asking, what do you know about the digestion and absorption of the cell-based products? Are they equivalent to animal-based proteins? I'd have to, uh, I'm not sure I can answer that uh, properly, Laura, so I'll have to take it fast, but happy to get back to you with our, our head of R&D for that one. Okay. okay. <laughs> That's a good Laura question. Peggy was complimenting you. I have to put that in there, Peggy. Thank you for the compliment for Lou on behalf okay. of Lou. <laughs> um, the next one is from Kevin Brady, and he asks, uh, is, this, is, this uh, is this considered a vegetarian friendly option or is this a new category? Um, it's, it's, it's not a vegan or vegetarian. It's an animal-based product, you know, in, in for, for certain. Uh, it comes from animal cells. It is an animal product. However, many, you know, have, we have candidly a fair amount of investors that are from the vegan community. Our early ones are for sure. Uh, they see this, uh, many vegans are ethical vegans, means it's, it's not about being animal free. It's about uh, not, you know, being slaughter free. Um, so so it's, it's not for everybody uh, that's vegan, but we are designing this for those who love seafood. And, uh, you know, but certainly uh, those that are ethical vegans may find this appropriate too. Next question is from Gretchen Muller, and she's asking, uh, do you think cell-based meat will ever be mainstream affordable, a, a mainstream affordable product, or will it always be a premium product? Um, everybody wants this to be mainstream and affordable and accessible for sure. It, you know, it, the, the key, you know, back to the earlier question, I think Rebecca, Rebecca asked, it's about economies of scale. So, so, so we need to, you know, this industry began with companies like Merck in the space. Now we're seeing Cargo, Vitreco, ADM, all the big commodity players are entering the space too. So when this, when this industry moves from the farmer grade supply chain to the food grade supply chain, it'll absolutely be affordable. So we need to get, it's the old story, we need critical mass of volume that will drive down those, those costs. This, is, this has been a microgram category that needs to move to truckload. And I've been the world's biggest proponent of getting, you know, you know, the large established commodity companies into the space. And we're starting to see some of that activity now. Here's a related. Mark, Mark uh, real quick, I just, this, this would be the last question. Oh, okay. All right. The, the, uh, let me, uh, next question was about price point. Uh, where, where do you think the target price point for the initial product will be when it's introduced to the public? Um, Good question. I, I think we're, we, we don't know, if, you know, I, I think everybody's gonna approach this a little differently. I think the plant-based category began at a premium. Uh, you know, they're, they're dealing the same thing as, as economies of scale enter their, their business. You know, they've already made announcements. They wanna be less than conventional meats in the next couple of years. This cell culture category when it launches will likely be the same. Uh, you know, it'll probably start off as a premium. And then also five years later, like many industries, uh, I believe will be uh, more affordable, particularly true in seafood. That's the beauty of seafood. If you look at the FAO numbers, it goes like this. If you see my hand, it's going like 30, 45 degree angle, wildly fluctuating through the year based on seasonality, only going up for the most part. Um, bluefin tuna is really just so endangered. It's uh, 
the price sensitivity is pretty enormous. So as conventional products go up, you know, our price will come, our cost will come down. So we feel that uh, over time, it could be quite less costly than conventional seafood. Great. So there's a number of other questions, Lou. I'll leave it up to you if you want to go into the chat box and reply back to some people if you want. Um, but we want to thank you very much for the presentation. It was a, you know, very informative. I thought it was a great topic. Um, and uh, I think we're moving on to um, some updates from the, uh, uh, the food science um, graduate and undergraduate students, reps. So I'll turn it over to Julia and Nicole. It's all yours. Thank you so much, Mark. And thank you so much, Lou, for such an interesting presentation about Blue Nalu. Hi, everyone. My name is Julia Buckray, and I'm a rising senior in the food science program here at Rutgers. I'm also the president of the Undergraduate Food Science Club. So while this year was not at all what we expected, of course, I am extremely proud of everything that the club accomplished. We knew that we wanted to make the most of the year, even though we wouldn't be able to be together in person. Food Science Club was always about coming together with a community of students who are passionate about food science. And we knew we needed to find ways to capture that spirit and energy even though we were all behind computer screens. We were able to smoothly transition and continue to host bi-weekly virtual meetings, including some amazing networking opportunities with the support of our wonderful alumni committee. Uh, another one of our goals was to expose our members to unique and diverse career opportunities within the food industry. So to do this, we recruited guest speakers that have really unique career paths including things like a research chef, food marketer, food safety specialist, and even an ice cream scientist for our fun end of the year science of ice cream meeting. We took advantage of engaging virtual opportunities that were presented to us, including hosting a collaborative meeting with the UC Davis Food Tech Club, which was with the help of IFTSA's Chapter Buddies program. So that was really, really cool to connect with food science students at UC Davis. Another thing that we did in order to bring our members closer together was creating our first ever peer mentoring program in which we paired first year sophomore and transfer students with upperclassmen food science majors. And this program allowed new students to become acclimated to remote learning, get career and internship advice, and also just make friends within the food science program which we knew would be a little more challenging online than it usually would be in person. So we're really, really looking forward to continuing to build and develop this program next year in person. And while we're still unsure of exactly what the fall semester is going to look like, we're really optimistic and hopeful that we will be able to gather together in person once again. I am so excited to welcome back our new and returning club members and continue our existing traditions as well as create new ones. Food Science Club has shaped so many of our college experiences as a whole, and we're looking forward to continue sharing our passion with our members once again next year, face to face. Everyone that is here tonight plays a role in having a positive impact on our current food science students. So to all of our alumni, faculty, and friends, thank you so much for all of your continued support. I will now pass it off to Nicole Tang, who is our rising IFT student representative to talk about our continued involvement with IFT. Thank you all so much. Well, hi everyone, my name is Nicole Tang and I'm also a rising senior majoring in food science. Um, and this year I'm the current IFT student representative for the undergraduate food science club. So if any of you are not aware of what IFT is, I highly recommend you to join as IFT is a great organization for fellow food science students or those working in the food industry or even those who are just interested in the science and trends in the food industry. Um, it is also a great opportunity for networking to meet with experienced professionals or those starting in food science. And what I've noticed based on our club experience is that the students who have participated in these IFT events have truly benefited from it. And for example, every year IFT pairs with big companies like Mars and Smart Foods and hosts a product development competition. And I was able to gain experience 
in not only product development, but also leadership and team working skills, which helped me give an advantage in applying for internships. So IOT also offers multiple scholarships and lists internships and job positions. So students and professionals can both take advantage for uh, their resources. And so over the past academic year, we were able to take advantage of so many opportunities that were presented to us by IFTSA. Uh, we participated in trivia student nights and um, chapter leader workshops, which enabled us to connect with food science students around the country. And we had two teams participate in product development competitions. And we were proud to share that our College Bowl team competed and came in in second place at the North Atlantic College Bowl uh, regional competition. So we're extremely thankful for the constant support from our alumni association. And uh, we co-hosted two student alumni networking events this year. And they were both such a huge success thanks to alumni association. And with help from Zoom, our students were able to connect with industry professionals like never before. So with that being said, we're very excited to continue our involvement with IFT in the coming year. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Laura Roccos. Uh, Laura served as chair of the Food Science Alumni Committee until last year. And she's currently uh, chair of the Food Science Advisory Board. And she is a PTO in the food science department, an active alumnus, and the owner and healthcare practitioner of Eagle Rock Nutrition. And so I will now pass it off to Laura for the presentation of awards. So if you can please help me in welcoming Laura. Thank you, Nicole, for the introduction. Um, so everyone knows that uh, every year the Rutgers Alumni Committee hosts uh, a, a reception as part of the IFT annual meeting and food expo. And during this meeting, we present various awards to our alumni. And this year, it gives me great honor to present two awards to some um, colleagues, uh, classmates, and close friends. So I'm first going to read the definition of these awards. So we've been um, bestowing these awards for many, many years. And over the years, we've had the opportunity to flesh out what the awards truly mean to the department. So this year we will bestow the leadership award to Claire Duss and the award for scientific achievement, achievement to her brother, Stephen Duss. So first I'm going to read the definitions of these awards so that you know what they are. So the leadership award recognizes a Rutgers food science alumnus serving in a leadership role in industry, academia, or government who has brought honor to their own organization and to food science technology through their accomplishments. The award for scientific achievement recognizes a Rutgers food science alumnus who has advanced the field of food science through scientific, through significant scientific achievement and discovery. They have demonstrated a body of work in academia or industry that supports the advancement of food science. Um, just so that you know, we do have some other awards. We don't bestow every award every year, right? But the other awards are for communication. And uh, we also usually have a special recognition. And re recently, we have championed some student awards. But I'm just bestowing these two awards for leadership and scientific achievement. So I'm going to first introduce the award to Claire Duss who graduated from the Rutgers Food Science Department with a BS in 1985. She, she subsequently earned her mastery certificate in polarity thinking and is trained in facilitation of creative, creative problem solving um, processes. And creative problem solve, solving is also known as CPS. So that was new to me. All right, some career highlights for Claire is that she has spent since graduating from the food science department, 35 years at a single company, Sensory Spectrum, overseeing the managed services, education and training and innovation platforms for this company. Uh, her decades long career has allowed her to, and I quote, leverage deep sensory attribute knowledge with consumer and market insights and needs which I believe is just a fancy way of saying that she's really good at her job 
a leveraging sensory evaluation to for consumers. Um, she uses her experience in sensory evaluation um, uh, in polarity thinking and CPS processes to create innovative solutions that may be applied to the sensory evaluation process. Currently, she, oh, she serves as chair elect for the Society of Sensory Professionals, which is a very esteemed position, and served on the Board of Trustees for the Creative Education Foundation. In her spare time, such as this week, Claire, um, uh, uh, so instead of traveling the globe as she can on her vacation, she chooses to volunteer every summer with her church, St. Patrick's, uh, supporting an Appalachia um, endeavor, uh, which is called Appalachia Help Weeks, where she helps to repair homes for the rural poor of West Virginia. So I'd like to thank Clara for her contributions and invite her to just say a word or two in receiving this award. Hello, everyone. So yes, um, I am sitting in West Virginia. In fact, in my car, because that in the parking lot of the VFW where we're staying, because it's where the, uh, the signal is the strongest. Um, and as I want to say I was really intrigued a lot by a lot of what Lou was talking about, because when you happen to be working with people who cannot afford food, or happen to be in a food desert. It reminds me about what a great opportunity we all have as food scientists to make great impact um, and to really put our whole self forward. And I'm always thankful for my time at Rutgers because um, it was there that started me on this path that got me here because it was during that my time as a student there that um, I was really taught great foundational food science. And that shows up in my job pretty much every single day in managed services at Sensory Spectrum. We have, um, we have team members and employees inside of food companies who actually operate the sensory testing labs. And so we work from the beginning to end in the whole, whole food cycle. Now, Laura asked me what was my favorite my favorite project and after 35 years I mean there's just so many and I told her I couldn't choose it was either three days tasting bananas in Honduras for an agricultural study or three days feeling women's legs for a razor you know efficacy study so sensory is the whole being and that's also true in food it's not just taste it's a it's a sense of touch it's a sense of sound and it's a sense of hearing so thank you Laura for um, the nomination and it was so great to see some some past friends um, even from my car in the parking lot so I thought you would say when my, my boyfriend, who's my husband now, at the time that you got this job said, well, well, Claire, when you need a volunteer for a mattress tester, let me know. And well, I've done that. <laughs> yes. right, right. right. So I'm really pleased to honor the Dust family, who are really a legacy Rutgers family. They live, lived in New Brunswick. Uh, uh, Piscataway. Right. They lived in yeah. Piscataway at the time that they went to Rutgers. And there are so many of them. Even um, Clara's sister, Joanne, works for the, um, she works in publishing the Rutgers Alumni Magazine. But I'd She's like on the call. Oh, great. Hey, Joanne. So I'd now like to recognize Stephen Duss, who has a long history in the food science field. He graduated with his bachelor's degree in food science in 1988 with a research, research and management option and subsequently received his master's degree in food science from Rutgers in 1987. Um, he has held numerous roles at Kraft Foods Nabisco Brands, which is now Mondelez, um, too numerous to, to, to name, but consultant, process technologist, um, research associate group leader, section manager, and program manager um, from 1990 to 2009, so a long legacy of positions at Kraft and Nabisco Brands, followed by a um, followed by a short stint at Sara Lee Fresh Bakery, um, followed by the director of um, product development at Sara Lee Hillshire and Tyson, where he serves now at Tyson Foods as senior director and director of prepared food innovation product development. 
So I'd like to congratulate Stephen for earning our Scientific Achievement Award. This is quite a long le legacy and I'm quite happy to finally honor a, a true food science family. So I invite Stephen to say a word or two, pretty hard to follow in his sister's <laughs> footsteps with her um, words. But Stephen, would you like to say anything? Yes, Laura. Uh, first, uh, yeah, thank you for, for, for that. Um, and uh, thanks everyone for, um, for today's event. I, I think it was uh, really, really great. Um, I also want to thank Claire for getting me into food science. That was not my, my intended pro, uh, major when I, when I came to college, but she, she really excelled at selling the, the benefits and, and the desirability of joining the program. And I haven't looked back since. Um, I'm uh, particularly happy to see uh, Nicole and uh, the other other students on the on the session today, uh, carrying uh, the tradition on and knowing that you're going to join a vital industry uh, globally. Um, I work for Tyson Foods, a very large food manufacturer. Uh, Lou mentioned scale. We have scale and protein, and it's it's an amazing thing to to be part of and and to to see how those products get to everyone's table or to their favorite restaurant or on top of their favorite pizza. And uh, the um, efforts that go into it start with, with the science involved in the production and preservation of those products. And through, through my career now in innovation uh, is looking at what comes next and looking at how the, the areas of opportunity to expand pro, uh, protein to the forms that even Lou mentioned uh, is exciting, and to be part of a legacy, uh, you know, protein company that that processes more than forty million chickens a week, as an example, it's interesting to think about what's going to uh, be needed to kind of satisfy uh, those demands from the marketplace. Uh, so I'm I'm honored to have uh, received the reward and appreciate uh, the uh, opportunity to come here and meet with you all. Well, thank you, Stephen. It's my understanding that uh, Irene Weston, who's the administrator of the department, uh, we have to definitely thank her for all of her efforts year after year after year uh, supporting our awardees. And I think that she will um, send you your plaques. But thank you very much to all the, the Dust family supporters who have joined the call today. And uh, I hope that you enjoyed this uh, presentation from Lou, which was fabulous, Lou. I loved it. Thank you. So actually, I have two more awards that I'd like to go ahead and present tonight. You know, we were talking a lot about just recently now the students and their engagement and all that they've done. And so the, the next award that I'd like to go ahead and present is to Akino Tomazawa. Uh, you know, Akino has been just working tirelessly, not only in the undergraduate club, but participating in the alumni committee, um, really bringing us the student perspective um, not only just from what's going on with respect to the, the classroom, but the challenges outside the classroom and, um, and, and so forth. She's just tireless at doing so much. The other thing is, is that she really facilitates student engagement in all of these activities. And you could see when Nicole was, uh, Nicole and Julie were both reading off what the, the club has been involved in. It's just phenomenal. Uh, so I would like to go ahead then and present to uh, Akino the Special Recognition Award for all that she's done for uh, food science, Rutgers Food Science, but also for uh, Rutgers Food Science alumni. So thank you so much, Akino, um, for all of your efforts. We greatly appreciate that. If you'd like to say anything, you may. Um, yeah, no, I'm, wow, well, I'm like really surprised, but... <laughs> So happy to hear that. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Um, I just, I just love our foodie family, as I like to call it at Rutgers. So um, it was just something that I enjoyed doing. So it didn't seem like work, but um, I really appreciate you guys um, recognizing my efforts. And yeah, I, I'm, I feel unprepared, but thank you so much. I really appreciate it. <laughs> That's the best part. <laughs> <laughs> Surprise. You're so very awesome. welcome. Thank you. Thank you. So the, the final award that I want to go ahead and present is the Distinguished Leadership Award. And this award goes to Laura Roscoe's. I mean, she's been just amazing. I think, you know, when they, 
when they were coming up with a definition for energy, it must have been watching her and all the things that she's involved in. Uh, she's just been tireless engagement, as you know, not only for the alumni committee, but also for our, um, our advisory committee. So she's been involved in so many activities. And just beyond that, as uh, you know, it's been mentioned before, she also teaches the nutrigenomics and nutraceuticals course. Uh, so I, I really just don't know how she finds all the time to do so many activities, but it's just amazing. And Laura, we just so much appreciate all that you've done for us literally over years upon years upon years for uh, Rutgers Food Science and also for all of the Rutgers alumni out there. So again, special recognition to you for the Distinguished Leadership Award. Thank you, Laura, for all. I'm speechless, Carl. Yeah, you guys also caught me off guard. So, you know, I can really well relate to being speechless, but thank you for the recognition and you really didn't have to. Was, this is uh, a, a labor of love for me and the Rutgers Food Science Department is my family. It's where I most feel at home, especially in room 101. There you go.